I'm Laura London, and this is a special video edition of Speaking of Jung. Joining us today for episode 118 is Jungian analyst and author, Dr. Bernice Hill in Boulder, Colorado. Born in Ontario, Canada, she attended McMaster University, where she studied biology and chemistry, and later worked as a research chemist for the Canadian Department of Defense, studying the effects of atomic irradiation on biological materials. Appalled at the destructiveness of nuclear weaponry, she left science for social action and relocated to the U.S., where she attended Rutgers University, earning a master's degree in sociology and later a second master's and a Ph.D. from their graduate school of social work. Dr. Hill then relocated to Colorado, where she worked as a psychotherapist and, in 1983, entered the training program of the Interregional Society of Jungian Analysts, graduating with a diploma in analytical psychology, which is the degree of a Jungian analyst, in 1990. She practiced as a Jungian analyst for over 30 years and served as a senior training analyst for the C.G. Jung Institute of Colorado. She is also certified as a facilitator of Stan and Christina Groff's holotropic breathwork. Dr. Hill has conducted workshops at the Monroe Institute, been involved with the philanthropy conferences at MIT and Naropa University, and has been an active member of the International Society for the Study of Subtle Energy and Energy Medicine. While attending the Star Knowledge Conference in 1996, she participated in a circle of 12 women in a ritual offered by New Zealand shaman. As a consequence, she organized and took pilgrimages to Peru, New Zealand, and Egypt. Dr. Hill has presented seminars on UFOs and extraterrestrials to mental health professionals and the public throughout Colorado and in 2010, co-founded Boulder Exo, Exo Culture, Exo Politics, and Exo Consciousness. Its purpose is to explore in a public forum information from contactees, corporate and military whistleblowers, and other researchers. She is the author of three books, Emergence of the Cosmic Psyche, UFOs and ETs from the Perspective of Depth Psychology, Spiritual Perspectives on Death and Dying, winner of a 2016 Independent Publisher Book Award, and Cosmic Human, Cosmic Intent, published in 2020. Please visit our website, speakingofyoung.com, where you will find links to everything discussed in this episode in the show notes. This video interview is being recorded on Wednesday, February 8th, 2023 through the magic of StreamYard. Thank you so much for joining us today, Dr. Hill. Thank you, Laura. Thank you for inviting me. Yes. Well, I have been really excited to talk to you because the subject of your book, Emergence of the Cosmic Psyche, has been a huge interest of mine for decades. I have been interested in UFOs and ETs since the 1980s, and I have been wanting to speak with the Jungian analyst about that subject, because being involved in that community, they don't often talk about psychology uh, or the psychology of the people making the claims. And there is so much to this field, and your book is wonderful. I know that was your first book, and uh, I will. We will get to that. I just um, I want to start actually with a little bit of your background because it's very unusual. I think it's a very unusual topic, and you you were trained as a scientist, like I was, and you worked as a chemist, so you know how evidence works and and causality and then you went into social work so you know how groups work and you know and you know human behavior and so you're kind of bringing these two things together which i think is fascinating so let's start with your background and and how you got to where you are today <laughs> 
<clears throat> well, science uh, came really after my interest in nature. I grew up in this small town in um, southern Ontario and about six miles from Lake Erie. And so the woods and the lake were great recreation grounds for me. And so when I went to McMaster, I went into uh, biology and chemistry. That, of course, led eventually to the uh, employment by the Canadian Department of Defense. And you're right, I was, I was appalled by what I learned there uh, for so many reasons, but we got daily um, reviews of old films, <clears throat> films of uh, use of nuclear fission and the damage that it did to all sorts of living things. Um, and so part of the research was irradiating things that lived, whether it be bacteria or plants or different creatures. And I could see that uh, the particular project I was on was uh, looking at what happened to the mitochondria mm -hmm. <clears throat> and uh, in those cells or those living things. And it was devastating, of course, what the radiation does to that. So when I left, I went home and I stayed at home for a while, raised my family mm -hmm. and uh, went back and thought, you know, the issue is the, the human psyche. This is the core issue here. And so um, I went to uh, Rutgers to do those uh, sociological studies, really. Um, and then from there, um, I got drawn into much more of the personal clinical work, which interested me at that time quite a bit. And uh, so that's where I sort of took that thread of my life. So your interest uh, in in UFOs, in ETs, in spirituality, which I want to get into later, because sometimes I think that there's a, a confusion or a blending of topics here. How did you go from uh, you earned your Ph.D. in social work? and you worked as a clinician, but then you decided to train as a Jungian analyst, which is not an easy thing to do. And it took you, what, you were in training for seven years. Okay. After your two master's degrees, a PhD, and then you decided to train for seven years yes. to become a Jungian analyst. Right. Now, Laura, because of dreams, dreams will lead you to amazing places. Mm. And uh, I had a dream, I was working in the medical school uh, in New Jersey and uh, had a fairly responsible position, but I kept having a dream I was on the wrong road. You're um, on the wrong road. I was on the wrong. <clears throat> so that led me to come to Colorado. Uh, I had very fine work uh, given to me by a Jungian analyst uh, in Princeton, New Jersey, and working with her encouraged me to step out and find nature and find my uh, mm. love of working with the psyche and it's dirty. Mm. So you moved to Colorado and you entered the, the uh, Inter-Regional Society of Jungian Analysts has a training seminar there in, in Colorado, right? And that's where you, and so would you tell us a little bit about your training? Well, I'd like to just mention briefly that uh, I had a synchronistic event that, that yeah. really sort of was there at the beginning of my training that I had a client who was quite ill and I visited that person in the morning of the, uh, the examinations for entry and that client died. Um, so two hours later or three hours later, I found myself talking to a whole series of committees. Uh, and of course the question they love to ask is, uh, did you have any dreams last night? Mm -hmm. And so I did have a dream. Mm. And the dream was um, that Christ was in my backyard. He was very frustrated with me. And he was pointing to uh, a little poem on the wall, uh, that poem about uh, beneath the bright and starry sky, lay me down and let mm. me die, like the hunter home from the hunt, the sailor home from the sea. And then, of course, with combined with what had happened in the morning to me, that door sort of swung open into training. So, so that was my training <laughs> into that. And, and then, and then you, you enter the training program. And so you, what was your area of interest? Uh, because 
uh, in training to become a Jungian analyst, you also write a thesis at the end. That's correct. Uh, I wrote a thesis on the great mother and the addiction, addiction of the great mother archetype. Um, and I had done that because uh, somewhere along the Jungian training, I wanted more body work uh, back mm. then. And so I had connected with uh, Stan Groff um, because of his particular interest in the deeper psyche and also uh, how the psyche got activated through psychedelics in the body type of thing. Mm -hmm. and so that led me into write that thesis, which was some combination of the Jungian work and uh, what had come up with uh, Stan Groff's work, the breath. It's the breath work. So I noticed in your book, your second book, uh, Spiritual Perspectives on Death and Dying, you say that Stanislav Grof is the natural successor to Jung and his exploration of our deep psyche. So tell us, because I'm not that familiar with his work, tell us a little bit about why you say that. Why is he the natural successor to Jung? Um, <clears throat> he, of course... Um, was trained as a Freudian analyst in Prague, Czechoslovakia. And uh, when the uh, when LSD-25 was produced, it was mm -hmm. sent to leading researchers around Europe. And uh, so he <clears throat> had several uh, years experience of uh, researching after that, people in all states and all psychological uh, life uh, states, and so he had begun to work out a certain pattern uh, with what he saw there. And uh, he had said in the process that he was skeptical of what would happen, but that over the years of working in that way, he um, had really discovered that despite his, his Freudian training, that Jung himself had a much more accurate mm. notice of what was going on in the human psyche. Mm. And you, as I said in the introduction, you trained in his technique. Uh, he and his wife, Christina, have a technique called holotropic breath work. And I, I think the listeners might be interested in knowing a little bit about what exactly that is. <clears throat> well, the, um, the holotropic breath work began when the American government set sent uh, really closed down all psychedelic research. Mm -hmm. uh, by this time, Stan had come to the United States and he was working on a program with John Hopkins uh, in which they were, um, the program was to administer um, LSD to people who were terminally ill. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and so very carefully prescribed, uh, and it was a volunteer program, there were over a hundred people in that, um, was um, uh, the use of the LSD. And I just, as I said, I'd say that um, in that case, um, the people sort of had their own unique experience, but it unfolded the pattern that Groff was continually seeing. Um, and they died with much less anxiety because they had mm. such a much bigger understanding of their own, of the psyche and their own journey. Well, then the government, of course, did shut down the LSD and all other psychedelic research. Yeah. And uh, he and his wife, Christine, developed holotropic breathwork. And the holotropic breathwork is, is drawn from the Hindu tradition and it's uh, profound and deep breathing. Uh, and also uh, in the program, they added very evocative music mm -hmm. and they did body work, uh, very light body work if it was necessary. If a person got stuck in some situation, uh, uh. They, they were trained to sort of do light body work and to help them move down. There might be something very simple like comforting or something of that nature. Right. So you uh, trained and became a certified facilitator. And so do you use that or did you when you were, you're retired now from your private practice, when you were practicing as an analyst, did you use that? Not with my clients. Okay. But I, but we had, I had friends and we were, would uh, organize workshops and do that uh, in the public. For, you okay, know, so, public. so you did that separately. Yeah. yeah. And what else was that used for? Um, so chronic pain or illness or or just even uh, relaxation? 
the, the uh, cross uh, process? Y yes. Um, well, with trained facilitators, of course, people in the public came who wanted to experiment with that. Mm -hmm. um, but um, uh, that, I, I'd like to talk a little bit, if I could, um, just about what it was, what what Stan found in his- Yes, please. Learning, you know, maybe that would help uh, at this point. Mm -hmm. I understand that. Um, as I say, Stan was very, uh, um, very <laughs> Stan had 60 years eventually with, with psychedelic research, and he's still alive in his mid-90s. And um, what he found that, true to what Jung had written about, you know, we got into our complexes and we got into this, the sort of theme that uh, stirred us through our life that we're usually worrying about each day. Um, and that um, there certainly was the human shadow in there that once you entered that uh, psychedelic process would come up. Uh, you would have your personal issues with power and sexuality and so on and that. But he began to see that people also would remember um, uh, what happened in utero. Uh, they would have memories in utero. In fact, Stan is very well known for that, for developing a process in which people can access uh, being in utero, uh, getting into the birth process and then being born. And he saw in those processes a fundamental often between that and people's subsequent anxiety and maybe uh, depression throughout their year. That was very mm -hmm. important finding. But then he also uh, discovered that people would go beyond that and they would begin to remember their past lives. They would have prenatal, beyond the prenatal uh, experiences, they would remember past lives um, and then beyond that, just as Jung had pointed out, within the natural psyche, uh, we, we have this ability to tune into nature in some fundamental ways. And it was really remarkable that people would recount sort of knowing the life of a particular bug or of a bacteria, or uh, they lived the life of a plant in the jungle of Peru or something, uh, or they were an animal. And later people could research that and find very accurate information. I think that's what Jung meant about accessing that. But also when they were doing that work and got deeper, it was there were usually just two to three hour sessions that were held. Um, they would get into meeting entities, um, meeting archetypal figures, uh, meeting uh, people from their ancestral and racial background, which of course, Young also pointed to. Okay, I, I just want to jump in here with a question. So just to clarify, this mm -hmm. is without LSD. This is through a breathing technique yes. only. Yes. The okay. Hindu, the Hindu process was very rapid and deep breathing. And then a person would begin eventually, the ego would be less uh, present in their field of consciousness. Um and then other aspects of would become to slipping in like, like a dream sequence and one would rest and then one would breathe again uh, more fully. And that would go on uh, for that period of the session. Yes. Okay. My, my question to you, because this is why I have you here is because I want to ask a Jungian analyst these questions. When you say that, yeah, when you say that, these people undergoing this breathwork session are remembering their past lives. Okay. My question to you as a Jungian analyst is how do we know this is a past life and not instead us accessing the information in the collective unconscious? I don't know that we can make a definite answer on that one way or the other. Um, I do know that when people have had past life recall, they're so powerful, they feel like an imprint to the person. So it has a certain sense of reality to them. But it may well be that the psyche has opened up so much that it's really tapping into uh, the great universal mind. I think it's those, both those things are possible. Mm -hmm. yeah. I think that it's because I have, for a, a very long time, struggled with the concept of reincarnation uh, back in 
2010, I met a group of Tibetan Buddhist monks on tour here in the United States. And uh, there are several groups, many groups, all from a monastery uh, in South India, Tibetans in exile. And I've actually done an, one of my quarantine episodes with one of them, a Geshe Larampa. And we keep in touch to this day, and we've had many conversations about reincarnation. And I would like to ask you, the idea of reincarnation and people remembering their past lives is how is it that that is quote unquote real, which is what we're going to get into uh, eventually here. Uh, what is real? Is it not a myth uh, that we sort of tell ourselves of what happens to us after we die or where we came from. How is the idea of reincarnation different from a myth? <clears throat> well, a myth also, of course, refers to a fundamental truth to the psyche, mm -hmm. something that's very intense and comes through with great power, which has such a convincing uh, quality to it that the person feels that it's real, um, definitely feels that it's real. Um, and often that's clinically valuable because you can use it then to see what's going on in today's complexes in the person and how they, that has a sort of a deep meaning to them because it seems to go back right into the archetype of the self of that person. And so to them, they're convinced that it's real. <clears throat> you know, there's thoughts now that, with the, uh, that the, um, the past life thing may be just all in their mind uh, and that one can open up directly to the universal mind. And that is certainly true. We know people such as your friend the, who have meditated all their life and, and who have, uh, you know, really reached for that universal mind through that process may not go through that uh, remembering of the past lives or it may not be relevant to them uh, or it may just, um, you know, be really irrelevant irrelevant to their life. Mm -hmm. I was thinking about that because I was uh, listening to someone speak about the constellations in the sky. And I have this deep love of the constellation Orion. And so I was listening to the myth. It's our myth. It's human, created by man, created by humans, this myth, because those stars, those physical stars in the sky aren't what the myth of the constellation Orion is about. That's what we are, the story that we've concocted about that shape of stars in the sky, right? So that is a myth. So when I hear somebody talk about their past lives, I think, well, that's, that's a story. That's a myth they weren't surely really embodied in that person 500 years ago, were they? <laughs> They're a myth to a human on the planet Earth because of our positionality so that the person looking at the sky and seeing that configuration uh, sees the ram, as it were. And for them, then that generates within themselves uh, all the all the richness that goes with that symbolism mm -hmm. of the ram. Mm -hmm. I'm sure if you were in a uh, out there next to closer to the uh, that particular constellation, it wouldn't be a ram. It would be something else. But the right. value the value is in the myth. The value is in the archetypal realm as expressed in the self um, by that particular individual that then the ram becomes something of great significance to them and becomes part of their story. A, because of the importance it feels to their psyche. Yes. Yeah, so there's, I understand that there is value in these myths. And von Franz said, we need a living myth. So I think that I'm just curious as to whether or not these stories that are out there uh, are real. Uh, and so let's get into that. What is real? 
And when we talk about UFOs and extraterrestrials and sightings, are these really physical objects that people are seeing? Or are they projecting something? Or is it something entirely different? There's a lot to unpack here. And I would like to look at this from a psychological standpoint, because as I said, in the UFO community, it seems like people are so hung up on the size of the light in the sky and what the light was doing and how far away it was and how big it is and how it maneuvered. And I'm wondering about the psyche of the person that had the sighting. The question about are they real is the question that hangs over this whole topic. Right. Uh, and it's certainly the question that hangs over everybody that's gotten interested in it. And of course the public is now getting more interested in it. Mm -hmm. um, but that is the fundamental question. And uh, it's also the question, of course, that Jung <laughs> asked himself uh, and brought in to his writings, yes. Mm -hmm. So Jung wrote an essay in the 1950s. Uh, it was published as a book. This is uh, an old hardcover edition. Uh, it was published uh, by, this one was published by MJF Books, uh, copyright 1978, Princeton University Press. Uh, the essay is titled Flying Saucers, A Myth of things seen in the skies. It is also included in volume 10 of Jung's collected works. This is a very popular book. I'm going to call it a book. It was an essay, but it was published as a book. And I know that also because I interviewed Jung's great grandson, Dr. Thomas Fisher, yeah. and he is a uh, part of the Society of Heirs. And he told me that uh, they have to keep renewing the copyright and they have to keep reprinting this book. So I've heard a lot of people, uh, especially lately since UFOs are in the news, uh, talk about Jung's book, Flying Saucers, and they say that they read it and they love it. And I'm wondering, okay, you read it, but did you really understand it? So I'd like for you to tell us yeah. your takeaways from this book. My takeaway is that Jung understood, because of his deep intuition, um, that there was something fundamentally linked between what people were seeing in the sky and the human evolution, what was really deep in the, in the soul and of, of human beings type of thing. And the fact that he put that idea out, you know, he really gathered that material in the 1950s. Mm -hmm. um, and Jung died in 1961, so right. he, he wrote the book a year or two before he died. Um, and what he said in the book was that he was fascinated. He could he, everything he could find, he would he put into that book. Um, and he said, "Well, um, um, you know, there's two situations. Either uh, there's definitely something in the sky that uh, people see, and then it's reflecting in their psyche and in their dreams." Or um, they're not in the sky, but they're in their human psyche and it's being projected type of thing. And then he said then because he himself uh, was a psychologist type psychiatrist, then he was really interested in the why phenomena. In the why. Yeah. Yeah. But Jung also said that he was unwilling to deny uh, uh, because he got into some controversy, of course, with this book mm -hmm. eventually over, uh, when it came out. And um, he sort of quibbled a little bit, but he said he was unwilling to dismiss that there was objective reality to it because Jung himself knew about the radar tracings and uh, the, the reports of certain pilots. So that was there, and he, he said that, but the thing he really wanted to focus on was what was going on in the human psyche mm -hmm. that created that, yeah. And so what did he conclude? I mean, I know that, when he finished writing this, there wasn't nearly the amount of information that's out there today. And you know, Roswell happened in 1947, but it didn't become public until I think the 80s. So now 
I, I just want to interject this because it, something in your book was so interesting. You open the chapter on Jung, which I think is chapter two in Emergence of the Cosmic Psyche. You open that with someone getting really upset with Jung, saying that he set this field back because he's cl he claimed, which is erroneous, and I've heard other people in the UFO community say this, they dismiss Jung because they think that Jung said that this was all a projection, that people were projecting things onto just ordinary things that they saw in the sky, and they were projecting uh, aliens and UFOs and their being of extraterrestrial origin onto these things. Jung did not say that. So t tell us about that. Well, Jung looked at... Um seven dreams. He also looked at, at uh, uh, historical records as in paintings and in woodcuts. But he looked at seven dreams in particular, and he kept an eye on those dreams for the two levels. He was looking for what was going on uh, in the person's life and therefore what was the personal complex here uh, that might be projected. Uh, but he also kept an eye on what was the self doing in each of these dreams type of thing. And um, uh, you know, certain things turn, turned up in the dreams, like uh, was a person projecting it because uh, a certain need for inflation, or um, was a person projecting it because the dream was about death and they really had not yet acknowledged their understanding that they, they themselves were close to death, mm. to be type of thing. Mm -hmm. What Jung was looking for was how was the psyche's uh, self? What, what was the self of the psyche? really expressing and and what the, the psyche was really saying in these cases was that there's a bigger issue for each of the individuals at the soul and spirit level that also was calling them uh, forth as it were um, that and often the dream the, the there's a very important dream the uh, dream seven that was called and um, there were the person which he thought was it's most strongly expressed this thing about the self issue mm -hmm. that there was a young man and there was with a group of people outside uh, a UFO came some um, a woman came from the UFO and said to him we've been watching you and um, we we're wondering if you're going to fulfill your purpose and you saw that in the strength of the archetype of, of message which is you have a purpose are you fulfilling your purpose uh, that there was something afoot here uh, that really resonated with the bigger cosmos at that point in time. It resonated with the bigger cosmos. And so what is that individual to do that has that UFO dream uh, and not look at what is this saying about me and my life and my purpose or where I'm going, but instead just focuses on the UFO. Because that is what I'm seeing in the UFO community today is, is, as I said, is that there's so much focus on what is being seen and not on the seer and what's going on inside the seer. Very true. Uh, and yet what I've seen, Laura, is there, it's a remarkable fuller, fuller, flowering in the UFO community of people that really recognize, hey, this is a physical psychic event, whatever the UFO phenomena is, and that we're turning our attention much more to that uh, psychic aspect of the UFOs. And so you see springing up workshops and, and Zoom talks and whatnot, looking more and more about what is the human psyche doing uh, in this situation of its relationship? Uh, you know, I've seen a change in recent, in this recent, uh, I'd say four or five years. Mm -hmm. in that regard. Yeah. Well, my concern with the community is that the same stories are being repeated over and over again about what is going on here. And we're not getting any experts out there speaking. And so that's why I wanted to talk to you. You practiced as a Jungian analyst for over 30 years. Before that, you uh, worked as a, a clinical social worker. And so you have a, 
a very great understanding of the human psyche. And so what would you like to see happen in the UFO community around experiencers uh, coming to terms with what does this all mean? I mean, we're, again, we're chasing lights in the sky and we're arguing, arguing about uh, the different races of ETs that are visiting us, but we're not looking at, for the most part, we're not looking at ourselves. Um, that's all too true. And yet there, um, there is uh, potential, I think, within the Jungian community, because Jung, again, is so central, I think, to this issue. Uh, to um, do different things. I mean, even offering in the public a discussion of Jung's book uh, and what he was really pointing to and about the importance of the human uh, soul and how the soul would uh, uh, be so important in the journey of the psyche and that the, the soul itself is being activated at this time. So it's things of that nature when they're um, when there are public programs of that nature, uh, or and also, I think working, uh, um, I think also Jungian analysts, if they had more knowledge themselves of what is true in the field, if that would be very important. But I think if they could, uh, if the um, if the public also learned more, if you learn more about the human connection to UFOs you begin to see the importance of the, uh, the human connection, the, the, uh, the archetypal con connection within the soul and the, uh, the UFO experience. Um, I'm not sure I, I would worry a lot about that uh, issue. I think science itself will begin to draw closer to uh, this issue bit by bit. So um, I would say that programs such as yourself are very, very, very uh, welcome uh, and very necessary at this point in time. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you for um, your willingness to come on here and talk about it. Uh, one of the other big questions I have for you is on is about hypnosis and Jung's take on hypnosis and what you think of that field, that technique, uh, because I'm very concerned about how valid it is. Well, um, Again, they need a very qualified uh, practitioner in that regard. Um, I think to this um, respect, very light hypnosis was what was used by Dr. John Mack. Um, and he's a very qualified person. Um, but there are different levels of, of uh, hypnosis. Uh, again, I think what um, the, the factor is, uh, as you get into this, that one certainly uh, has the danger of maybe through the questions that uh, one is uh, being led through, but Dr. John Mack was very uh, professional in that regard. <clears throat> so again, the qualification of the person doing the work, um, the, um, I think also, maybe examining the, the content of what comes up, uh, the person has to ultimately return to their own individual sense of what, the, what their deeper self knows about this. So coming out of hypnosis and going back into recognizing that one needs to go into a deeper journey within oneself and just see, is this thing that coming up in, in the hypnosis of any value to me? Is it intense in any way. Uh, what's the intensity in it? What does it have to do with my own history and complexes? The, the situation returns again to the person returning to their own relationship to their deeper self, which is the core of the individuation journey. 
Mm -hmm. uh, which is why I think Jungians are uh, so sort of ripe in a way to come to this uh, topic. Yes. And and there there was only one Dr. John Mack and he was an MD. He was a psychiatrist. He was highly credentialed. And my concern in the UFO field is I see people who are certified hypnotists, hypnotherapists and that have a certification and I had said in the beginning of this episode that you have two master's degrees, a PhD, and then you train for seven years to become a Jungian analyst, which requires you yourself to be analyzed. And my concern is I see these hypnotherapists out there who don't have all that education and experience and background who are leading people into some sort of fantasy that they were abducted by aliens and given these messages and they said well it's true because a certified hypnotherapist led me to this conclusion and so i just want to say uh, i mean you can comment on that or not but that is a, a a huge concern of mine well i think that's true uh in hypnosis it's true in channeling um you know any of these where <clears throat> there is a, a sort of a, a, a looking for the answer from the outside, one has to use a certain uh, discernment or discrimination in that. Sure. Mm -hmm. okay. Well, what is happening in channeling? Because that was another topic uh, that we were going to discuss today. You know, people who are channeling disembodied spiritual entities uh, and the, even if the information is correct or valid, that again, they could be tapping into the collective unconscious. Why is that necessarily, uh, again, what I see as a myth that they think that there's this entity with a name that is speaking through them. So as a Jungian analyst, what do you say, what would you, how would you explain what's really happening with channeling? Again, the field is becoming <clears throat> more and more uh, subtle and complex. Mm -hmm. And so I think it's, again, not clear. And we're not sure about how accurate the information is going to be uh, coming back. Um, one of the things that uh, there are some very fine channelers, of course, we have you know, people that have written books that one recognizes is, is good quality channeling information. Um, but um, we really uh, have to come back to uh, the information that is given and the person has to take that in and hopefully with the help of, a, of an analyst work it through and, and test that against the reality of the situation. Um, it's the same thing with voices all through the UFO information. Uh, you hear people or a, a voice tells them and as mm -hmm. you would say in a dream, a voice tells them uh, uh, certain things like um, uh, in the dream of, of the man with the uh, UFO that landed in his backyard type of thing and asked him about his purpose. Um, was that voice his own or was that a real UFO that, that landed? Or not right. Type of thing. Um, the voices, oh, the whole thing about voices are confusing. And it goes back to this issue again, are the, what's real type of thing. Um, you know, most of us have had an experience maybe when we've been stressed or something of what we hear a voice. Uh, uh, I heard a voice of my father in the back seat of my car, a client would tell me, you know, and I knew that the situation that they were in, that that probably was part of their uh, personal complex that they were working through, that the, the father said, you need to solve this problem. Um, but we also have voices. At one point in time, I had Robert Salas, who was... Um, lieutenant in charge of the missile sites um, uh, in uh, Montana that were set, were all turned down by a UFO that appeared on his gate. Um, and so sitting in my uh, living room with a group of friends talking to Robert Salas, Salas said he sent in his report about the shutdown of these instruments that had to be shut down, but that he in his head heard a voice that said, we are going to shut you down. Well, in a situation like that, in the context of that, um, 
Well, I would have to assume that this man was sincere because he went on in his military career, a very honorable military career. And he was the one that set up many of the conferences in Washington uh, uh, that led to further exploration by the military, uh, whistleblowers in that spot. Mm -hmm. So again, the field is coming so that one needs to, to uh, learn as much as one can, read as much as one can, uh, set your own standards for that, and yeah. uh, take each situation and, and work through the different layers that are possible. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, that, again, uh, there's so much being written uh, in this field. There's so much being published in this field, written by people that don't have any credentials or any credibility. So to me, they're, it's all coming from within them, their complexes, their projections, if they haven't worked on that stuff. Or they're repeating what others have said. So that is my concern. And that is why your books, I feel, are so valuable. Um, because you have been analyzed. And you are looking at all sides and considering all things. But I, I'm interested in what Jung said about telepathy. I mean, as far as hearing voices, that could indicate some sort of psychopathy, right? Uh, Absolutely. Right. Yeah. So, and, and just because somebody has a good job or a high paying job doesn't mean that they don't also have some issues that they haven't resolved. Absolutely. And that would be the first line that one would need to assess for. You need to be responsible to make sure they did not have other signs of psychosis. Mm -hmm. Yes, you did that. But having then um, dealt with that, then you would move much more into okay, what else is coming up from the unconscious or the collective unconscious that is stirring this in this person that might be of something to having to do with their own evolution of their own individuation. Mm -hmm. So that is important to keep coming back to. I think. Mm -hmm. You have to rule that out in question. And I would like to encourage the listeners uh, who are thinking about um, doing this inner work that Jungian analysts don't pathologize symptoms. You're not going to be committed or medicated because Jungian analysts don't do either. Uh, but to explore these things uh, within you with someone who isn't biased. Uh, for instance, it seems like everybody who gets hypnotized to, to figure out whether or not they were abducted goes to the same people. So my sense is that you're going to come out of those sessions thinking you were abducted. So let's get into that a little bit. Uh, if you would indulge me, um, when there are these stories of abduction and we don't know what's really happening and if it is real as we were alluding to earlier if it is a real physical event why the jump to this is an extraterrestrial from another world and not something else doesn't that also say something about that person's psychology? You wouldn't jump to it, for sure. Uh, you know, you would really have to explore uh, if there was any other possibility for them. Uh, but usually what you will find there is that um, it's at such a deep level of impact, again, like, uh, like um, uh, past life experiences, mm -hmm that you would have to take it seriously at some, at some level, that something very profound happened there. And um, I have a friend who did a two-year postdoc with Dr. John Mack, and she said, I was asking her about this the other day, and she said, <clears throat> she, she said this, for most experiencers, there is such a profound sense of relief and hope in the presence of those who can see them without judgment uh, can accept their confusion and can, can accept the fact that this might be a very real experience, you know. So um, there has to be an openness on the part of those who 
may have had this experience, they may not. It may also have been part of the uh, symbolic process within uh, the person's deeper unconscious. But for those who, who definitely stay with their story and can give information that would somehow back that up, uh, they really need a safe place. Uh, they need a place to reveal the process as they think it happened to them. Um, and they need someone who can shift that trans transformative thing that can lead uh, to their own evolution. I'm not mm -hmm. saying that uh, that is just in their imagination. I'm not saying that they actually had a, an abduction. We don't know. Uh, but it's interesting that both John Mack and, and also uh, Carl Jung wrote about that. This question about did it really happen, it's, it's a secondary question. Mm -hmm. The secondary question is that this person and mankind <laughs> at this point in time needs to realize that their fundamental relationship with the self when the unfolding of the journey of the soul uh, within them uh, and the different stages that that goes through, that is the fundamental thing that's being stirred in the person. And whether it's stirred by a rumor, whether it's stirred by an experience or not, it, it comes back to that point. Mm -hmm. So as a Jungian, we are to look for, as you said, the dark in all of this light. So in people thinking that these are these, um, I, and I still don't understand why the connection between seeing a light in the sky and thinking that it's this this positive, spiritual, um, important event. What's, I guess, let me ask you then, what did you mean by that? That as a Jungian, we are to look for the dark in all this light. Well, the dark is partly the ignorance, <laughs> uh, the unknowing, uh, the fact that things are happening that are unknown. Uh, partly it's uh, uh, feeling powerless you know, people project out things that uh, is sort of like rescue from heaven type of thing. Yes. Um, but um, there's no question of being young, and you, you do have to ask those questions. You have to go through the different layers of the psyche uh, to, to exhume those. That, that can never be forgotten in any case to make sure that you're not mistaking something as being true, objectively true that is really part of the human particular individual's shadow material. Uh, but when you do that and they stay still with the fact, uh, then you get the, the fruit of this shocking experience of seeing lights or hearing a voice from an ET. And, and the fruit um, truly is that mankind is being stimulated <clears throat> to open up to other aspects, uh, other ways of relating uh, and being in relationship with other people and being in relationship with their own unconscious, which modern man knows nothing about, according to Jung, and he's quite right, uh, to open up to that journey of beginning to have a dialogue with the soul, beginning to uh, listen to the soul's voice in, in each situation that you're in, uh, that the... That the uh, the reality of the um, of the stimulus, wherever it comes from, is a stimulus. As Jung said, and this is his great contribution. This is why I think Jungian trainees, or I mean people being trained, should take uh, the the um, um, flying saucers myth of the thing seen in the sky. Should take that into their uh, study groups with their trainees, because it, the fundamental thing is that man's future and unfolding is going to be in how he, what Jungians have come to say, the ego self-access, the ability of the ego to begin to listen more to the soul's input on a daily basis type of thing. You know, uh, that, that, that is what will change the human psyche, whether it's back to stronger mental health or whether it's societal. That is what is really being asked for in this phenomenon. Mm -hmm. And I, mm -hmm. 
Sorry. Go ahead. No, I was going to say, and I believe that the one-on-one -on -one work, the work with an analyst, an Alisand analyst, that one-on-one -on -one work, I think is crucial. Yeah. And what I don't see happening because people want to be part of a group. And when you're part of a group, there's this group think, this hive mind, and everybody's just uh, identifying with one another and repeating the same things back and forth. And you're not really getting into your personal complexes and your personal unconscious. So that's another concern of mine that I see in the field. A valid concern, very valid. Um, that's why um, there, there would be some hopefully good uh, group facilitation uh, to ask questions such as you're asking type of thing. So people do think more deeply about that. But there is also the other side of that, Laura, is that experiencers who have had some deep experience um, do best in groups, if the truth be known, because there's an immediately relief there. Now, maybe it's the relief of the uh, people with the same neuroses in the same um, state, but it is also the relief of people who have had a profound experience, have been moved at a, at a deep level, who have seen things that are not explained by our present worldview um, and have certain wisdoms, a certain senses of responsibility as well. Uh, and they can't share that very well other places. So the group expression in that regard is, is also one helpful avenue here. Uh, but granting the careful need um, to take care of the psyche of the, of the being who's coming to you for help requires the scrutiny of asking the questions that you are asking. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that's uh, uh, definitely a concern of mine. Just going back to the light and the dark, uh, what I wanted to add and let the listeners know that in your book, Emergence of the Cosmic Psyche, you do have two chapters. Chapter seven is titled Contact the Lighter Side. And then chapter eight is titled Contact the Darker Side. And then you get into the shadow. And I don't know if there's anything further you wanted to say about the shadow and shadow issues for, for contactees. Uh, and uh, if that's even, I don't even know if that's being dealt with. I mean, I, one of my other concerns is I hear people, I, I, I see because I've been on Twitter for so long, people are interested in the shadow. And when I use that hashtag shadow in the quotes that I post, um, they get a lot of interest. And I know that the the episodes that I've done on speaking of Jung about the shadow are the most popular episodes. And I'm always very surprised about that because people seem to like that topic, but I don't see a full and thorough understanding of it. And that was made evident uh, in the past few years with our political situation here in the United States, where the all of the vitriol and criticism of our politicians, to me, was all about the shadow, uh, the personal shadow and the collective shadow. And people say they want to do shadow work, but, you know real shadow work, that's not an easy thing to do. And I don't think it is what people think it is. So would you say a little bit about the shadow in this whole, in, 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 the, in this whole topic? Well, I, I think in terms of the shadow, or often in terms of power issues, either inflation or, or deflation type of thing, uh, or it's what's not known and is trying to break through and come through type of thing. So I think even using the shadow as a hashtag is a, a sort of a stroke of brilliance because it would lead people in to explore that. I mean, even the one that you're exploring uh, about um, um, the, uh, the sort of the constant denial uh, or the, or the uh, there's only one theory that's gonna fit this particular situation uh, or that they can be leading if, if poor, poor uh, um, hypnotists are used or channelers. I mean, that is all shadow that's inherent in the field. But the biggest shadow that is in this field is what Jung said is 
modern man has no idea how complex uh, uh, the psyche is. And a shadow has been raised in the collective psyche that has to do that it doesn't recognize yet that three-dimensional um, uh, operation is not the only operation in which real living entities live. Uh, there are other dimensions and there are other uh, capacities and other entities that can come into the human sign of, uh, field of awareness um, and that are not coming into the person as a crazy person, but are coming into a person because a person is more open and receive that. And then until the actual, uh, that, that is dealt with that type of, of closing off. I mean, one of the things that, um, that uh, Stan Groff said, you know, if you're going to have to land a, uh, a 747, you need to be in the three dimensional reality. But if you're not, everything else that's in the psyche needs to be uh, open to the tremendous potential of livingness that is in these different levels. And, and that is why, you know, he, he saw them coming up through the psychedelic experience. So, um, so I would rest the rest of there. Mm -hmm. I don't deny what you're raising and the skepticism uh, uh, about that you've raised here. It's, it's certainly valid, has to be followed, a question and explored. But when you get into what is not known, what you get into is what Jung was saying from the very beginning, uh, that ultimately this is an issue of the self, of the mandala. And, and it's when people are on that journey and the culture itself is on that journey in order to get beyond, beyond what's happening now, uh, that that is when uh, the richness of the human psyche can really be developed, which is what the times are asking for now. Mm -hmm. Well, the last uh, point I'd like to make uh, uh, as we come to a close here is that you do mention Jung's work with the physicist Wolfgang Pauli in your book. And I think that they just sort of ran out of time, didn't they? Uh, well, the interesting thing is that this phenomena of, um, of UFOs and ETs um, uh, is, has such an energy factor to it. You can understand Pauli's interest. Um, and um, what is being um, discovered now, of course, is that entanglement, I think I think Nobel Peace Prize people uh, this December uh, were given the prize for the issue of entanglement. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, sort of entanglement, it lost its uh, lure for a little while, but it's back now. Mm. The thing is that's brought up the what ancients have known, that the physicists are now actually approaching the ancients by saying, that when this universal field is really understood, it's seen as a great, great ocean, a great, great ocean of which our one individual psyche is a wave, you know? And so that there's a sense of wholeness that all things are connected. And that when we begin to understand that more, which we do when there is a little more soul infusion into the personality, uh, then Jung, what Jung had to say comes to full light, that the issue is the human relationship with its deepest, deepest self, the biggest archetype that we are open to in ourselves. The self, the biggest archetype. Uh, and when I was reading uh, what you had written about Jung and Pauli, it reminded me of something that I recently heard Jim Semivan said, say uh, that uh, he he's kind of on the forefront of of uh, the experts in the field right now. He's a retired CIA officer and he was talking about Lou Elizondo and what Lou Elizondo thought of UFOs. And he said that Lou thought that UFOs are somewhere between the nexus of quantum mechanics and consciousness. And so that remi reminded me of Jung's work with Wolfgang Pauli and how I wish that that would be discussed more and that that would be moved forward and taken up and and expanded on. And I don't know if that work is being done by anybody. If it is, please contact me at, at laura at speakingofyoung.com because I would like to know 
uh, if that work, if their work, what they were working on together is uh, being continued. So did you have any final words for us here today before we uh, close this up, Dr. Hill? Uh, no, just for people to know um, that Jung struck a true note and it's a true note that's just as valuable today and getting stronger. And as people get more into understanding for the UFO ET experience, they will recognize that he was one of the founding fathers of great wisdom about this issue. Thank you so much. Stay with me while I read the outro and stick around. I am now doing news and updates right here immediately after I say goodbye to my guest. Please visit our website, speakingofyoung.com, for more information on everything that was discussed in this episode. There you will also find all of the previous episodes of this podcast available to stream or download commercial free. The podcast version is also available on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and Amazon Music. So with very special thanks to Matt Jakubowski, Ralph G., Ian Angus Jones, Patricia P. and Liz Jefferson, I am Laura London, and you've been watching a very special video edition of Speaking of Young. Thank you so much, Dr. Hill. Take good care. So I am doing this a little bit differently today. I am doing our post-game, post-show recap here uh, as kind of the end portion of the episode. And I don't know if this is going to work. So what I was doing in the past is I was saying goodbye to my guest. I was ending the show. I was taking a little bit of a break and then I was coming back and doing a live stream with kind of news and updates and anything else I wanted to fill the listeners in on. And then that came, became uh, an issue uh, for various reasons. There's been a lot going on here behind the scenes. And uh, what I found is that it's not exactly safe, a safe space to share with just anybody. So I decided to open this up to open this YouTube channel up to memberships. And I did that and we got some members and I felt very uncomfortable about it because I had promised in the beginning never to put this podcast behind a paywall. Uh, I do not charge for uh, subscribers. I do not charge for content. Everything is free. Everything is available for free, commercial free at speakingofyoung.com. Uh, we are an Amazon affiliate uh, and that is disclosed throughout the website. If you purchase anything on Amazon, we do get a very, very, very small commission. So all of the Amazon links are affiliate links. What I wanted to go over today is uh, a few things. Uh, one is that there will be another episode of Speaking of Young. I've only been doing these once a month, but there will be two episodes in March. I'm being really careful not to give away who my next guest is, guest is because I've already recorded that episode. It is, I've been uh, kind of teasing it as a top secret episode. I actually don't need this anymore. It's driving me crazy. Uh, top secret episode that was recorded on the 3rd, this past Friday, today's Wednesday, I recorded it on Friday, and it won't be released until March 1st. And I'm not going to say anything more because I'm really afraid I'm going to slip. That uh, will, as I said, be released. Uh, it is a video interview. It will be released on YouTube and on the website, our website, speakingofyoung.com. So I also have our March episode already uh booked, scheduled, planned. It is on Wednesday, March 22nd, and it is with a Romanian Jungian analyst. I've already talked about this on some of the post-game shows, uh, and her name is Lavinia Popa, 
and she has edited a book and Mark Winborn, who has been my guest three times here on Speaking of Young, is the co-editor of the book. It is a series of interviews with Jungian analysts about their backstories. And some of the uh, chapters, each interview is its own chapter. Some of the chapters are with analysts that uh, we've interviewed here on Speaking of Jung. Nora Swan Foster wrote the introduction. Uh, there are, I, I wasn't prepared. I'm going to have to search for this uh, so I can let you know who we will be discussing. Yes. So it was actually the foreword uh, to the book. And the book's name is, uh, title, sorry, is Beyond Persona. It will be released. Let me just give you a few details about the book. It will be released on March 24th, 2023 by Routledge. Its full title is Beyond Persona on Individuation and Beginnings with Jungian Analysts. Interviews by Lavinia Popa. Uh, it was edited, as I said, by her and Dr. Mark Winborn. So each chapter, an interview with an analyst. We've got Jung's grandson, Dieter Baumann. We've got speaking of Jung guest, John Beebe, Jean Shinoda Bolin, uh, Ernst Falsader from the Philemon Foundation. Uh, I had asked him to do an episode with me and he politely declined due to health reasons. We've got John Ryan Huell, James Hollis, Donald Kalshed, Alfred Ribby, Andrew Samuels, Hyeyong Shen, Murray Stein, Luigi Zoya, Mark Winborn, and Lavinia Popa. So that will be recorded and uploaded on March 22nd. I'm very excited about that. Um, there are going to be some great stories. And again, that book will be available from Routledge on the 23rd of March. So our spinoff show, Speaking with Laura, I've done two episodes and I've got another guest lined up. I've got the February guest. Uh, I feel like I've talked about all this before, but since these, these uh, recaps, these post-game shows have been available to members only, I will repeat the information here in case some of you didn't hear it. My next guest on speaking with Laura is John Warner the fourth, who is the son of the long time now late Senator John Warner, the third Republican from Virginia. That was his father is his father. Uh, his mother was the daughter of Paul and Mary Mellon who were patients of Jung's, uh, who knew Jung, and we're going to get into how they knew each other, what the extent of their involvement was. And so John Warner is part of the Mellon family. Speaking of UFOs, his cousin, Christopher Mellon, who I'm not sure if he still holds a position, uh, in the U S government, but, um, he, has been at the forefront of the UFO community since that 2000, 2017 uh, New York Times article came out. So we're going to talk about what he knows about his cousin's involvement in this whole issue. And so John Warner is going to join me live on Speaking with Laura on Wednesday, February 22nd. Uh, we're going to live stream in the morning and then it will be available uh, to watch back here on our YouTube channel, Young and Laura. I'm looking to see if there's anything else I wanted to add. Um, I did do, I did uh, schedule guests for the coming months. I don't want to announce them yet because I don't have the dates scheduled. I just have kind of verbal agreements from them. Um, but speaking of Jung is reverting back to once a month. And again, there will be two episodes in March. 
And moving forward, uh, 